five, so I'll get going. Um, I know it's the last session of the day, so I don't want to hold you up for your evening plans. My name's John Spray. I'm a developer at Red Hat, and I'm going to talk to you today about how you can use uh, CephFS to create a file system as a service with OpenStack Manila. So I'll start by giving you a brief introduction to Ceph and Manila, although this is not going to be in-depth on either of those topics. Um, it's really about the integration of the two. So how we map the concepts that the Manila API exposes to what CephFS is capable of, um, the experience of actually implementing that driver and working with um, the Manila interfaces to do that. Then there'll be a tutorial on how you can set it up and use it yourself. And finally, I'll go into some detail about the next steps here, since the driver that we have today is really just a beginning down this path. So CephFS is a distributed POSIX file system. That means you mount it um, over the network from a client node, and it looks just as if you had a file system mounted locally. So it has all the same POSIX semantics that a local file system would. It sends the data directly to the Rados cluster in, the, in your Ceph cluster. Um, and it sends metadata to Ceph metadata servers, which in turn store that in the Rados cluster again. So you benefit from all of the same data integrity and resilience that Rados provides when you're using RBD or RGW. CephFS is part of the upstream Ceph releases. Uh, so you probably already have it if you have Ceph installed. Um, if you are using vendor packages, it's possible that um, they might leave it out if they're not supporting it yet. Um, but if you're working with upstream packages, then you probably already have it. You can mount Ceph file systems using the kernel client, which is part of the upstream kernel. You can use the Fuse user space client. Um, and you can also use a library called libcephfs if you need direct access to the file system from your applications. And finally, the Ceph file system does a little bit more than most file systems. Um, it has directory-based <laughs> snapshots and it also has recursive uh, file system statistics so that you don't have to spider directories to get the stats about usage. So in visual form, that's what using CephFS looks like. You have a client at the top, which has a file system mounted, and it's talking directly to the Rados cluster to store the data for you. If you need more detail about CephFS, please come to Greg Farnham's presentation, which is in this room on Thursday. Um, and there's also a ton of information online in the form of the official docs at ceph.com. But if you also um, just go ahead and Google CephFS, um, you'll find there are plenty of talks and videos online for you to learn about it. So Manila is the OpenStack shared file system service. Uh, shared file system in this context means a file system that you can mount over the network from more than one guest at the same time, like NFS. That's distinct from um, situations where you might have a Cinder image with a local file system on that you could only access from one node at a time. Manila exposes an API that tenant applications can use to request some storage, to request that certain um, network entities are authorized to access the storage, um, and then to manage the life cycle of the storage, including um, providing quotas. Uh, to deal with the multi-tenancy aspects of having many applications deal with a fixed pool of storage. Manila maps those operations to different backends, depending on what you're using. So you might have a software-defined storage solution. You might have a physical uh, hardware appliance. And those modules in Manila are called drivers. Most of the existing drivers are for talking to proprietary storage systems, but there are a few existing open source ones already, um, especially GlusterFS, the new CephFS driver, um, and the so-called generic driver, which exposes NFS shares based on uh, Cinder volumes. So the usage of Manila looks something like this. The tenant is in the top left. Uh, he sends off an API request to Manila saying, I would like some file system storage. Manila picks the proper driver to send that request on to some backend. The backend assigns the storage, and the address that the client can use to mount the storage gets passed all the way back up to the tenant. Once that's happened, the tenant can pass that address into a guest virtual machine, which can in turn mount the file system. So at the point that the file system is mounted, nothing's flowing through Manila anymore. Manila is a control plane, and the data goes directly from your guest VMs to whatever backend you're using. So why do we want to put these two things together? Well, our favorite graph from the OpenStack survey that has uh, Ceph being used in the majority of clusters means that if you're looking for a Manila backend, the chances are you already have Ceph storage that you would like to use with Manila so that you don't have to deploy another system, another set of disks. It's also pretty useful 
that you can have an open source backend for your open source cloud. Um, you don't have to um, worry about buying some separate pieces of hardware from um, some storage specialized vendor um, in order to prototype and build out your clouds. Um, you can start with all free, all open source software. That's also really useful if you're a tester or a developer and you want to hack on Manila. You need a backend that you can just install yourself and use. And at the highest level, why do we want to do any of this at all? Why do we want shared file systems at all? Um, well, because applications want them. Um, there are a lot of applications out there that weren't necessarily built for the cloud, and some applications which are built for the cloud but find that the file system is a more appropriate model than object storage or block storage. Um, so all of this is ultimately about enabling your users to run their applications on your clouds. So the unit of storage that Manila works with is called a share. Um, and it's worth specifying exactly what they mean by that. So Manila combines the allocation of storage with the act of sharing it over the network. If you were um, using a normal Linux server, then you would separately create a file system on a disk and then configure your NFS daemon to export it to a particular place. Those are really two separate concepts, but in Manila, uh, they are combined. And once you've exported that, um, using Manila, that forms an independent namespace. So you can't uh, move files between Manila shares. They are individual um, atomic namespaces. Manila also expects that shares should be limited in size. That's a little bit of a, perhaps a, a hangover from the days when you were dealing with hardware um, storage controllers where you really would be carving something out of a LUN. Um, so we have to do a certain amount of work to enforce a side limit, a size limit, whereas um, I guess for other people, it's just intrinsic. So this doesn't exist as a concept built into Ceph, um, but we can take the primitives that CephFS gives us and use it to compose something which acts the way Manila expects it to. So the way we do that is we start with a directory. Um, we can use the layouts that CephFS has for controlling where data goes in directories. Uh, we can use that to send the data in one of these share directories to a particular Rados pool or Rados namespace. And that gives us our isolation between tenants so that one tenant can't reach into the um, Rados pool that another tenant is using or the Rados namespace that another tenant is using and go and touch his data. Um, the reason that that's necessary is if you recall the, that Ceph clients natively write directly to the Rados cluster. So um, if you had two clients, you have to make sure that they can't write directly to each other's Rados um, stored data. We use CephFS file system quotas to enforce a limit on the size. Um, and we also use Ceph's built-in um, authentication system to restrict what metadata clients can access. So rather than relying on clients being well-behaved and only mounting the directory that we would like them to use as their share, um, we have authentication on the back end that enforces that. Those um, ways of implementing a share um, map directly to CephFS features, some of which already existed and some of which were put in place or refined to deal with this. So the ability to limit clients by path is a fairly new thing that I think was in the Infernalis release of Ceph. Um, historically, clients could always change their um, layouts. So they, if you tried to limit them to a pool, they could always just point themselves to a different pool, so we fixed that, and there is a new uh, letter on the end of your MDS um, capabilities that you would need to have to set the pool on a layout. Um, we took the DF command, the statfs system call that's, uh, that fulfills that, and um, rewired it slightly so that instead of giving you the overall usage of your Ceph file system, what it does is look at the quota and the recursive statistics on the directory that you have mounted as a client, and um, use that to give you a slightly dishonest but more useful indication of um, how much space you've really got available on that share. And that kind of completes the illusion for the client that they really have a um, file system to themselves um, rather than having them realize that really we've just given them a directory. So if you're familiar with administration of Ceph clusters, that's what all this really means materially. So we've got a directory, We've got an auth cap, which gets created for clients who want to access one of these Manila shares. We have um, a quota, which is set using the usual uh, set F atra, get F atra interface to the extended attributes that CephFS uses to let you set quotas. And then finally, you, ha you have a crafted 
mount command that will use um, Ceph fuse with a dash dash client mount point option to point it to a particular directory and a dash dash name option that points it to using the specific um, authentication capabilities that we've crafted to limit it and lock it down into that particular share. So a note about um, access rules in Manila. So after you've created a share in Manila, you can't actually do anything with it until you've created some rules to permit clients access to it. In most of the existing Manila drivers, those rules refer to IP addresses. So you um, give it an IP subnet that should have access to it. Um, using IPs for authentication is um, not actually as scary as it sounds because those other drivers in Manila also use network virtualization to restrict um, clients uh, to only permit access to clients that have been added to a particular network in Neutron. But nevertheless, from Manila's point of view, it's IP addresses that you're authorizing. Whereas in the Ceph driver, we're authorizing um, user accounts. So not a networking concept, but um, an ID that lives within Ceph. Uh, there was a recent change to Manila right at the end of the Metaka cycle that changed the way um, we were expected to um, handle updates to uh, rules. Um, and that meant that um, we have a little bit of work to do to map their model to our model because Manila expects that you have a share and a list of rules for the share. Whereas in Ceph, we have a list of identities and each identity has access to some shares. So if you like, it's indexed the other way around. At the moment, when we're updating things, uh, we're updating the authentication um, rules in Ceph based on requests from Manila directly into the list of Ceph identities. Um, we don't have that backwards lookup to say exactly which rules um, apply to which shares when we want to look up by share. So um, we need to add an index there. This really belongs in the future work section, but it's um, worth calling out as an example of where the Manila model of the world isn't really as general as you might expect. It turns out not to map quite so well to some systems as it does to others. So this, um, this work to create this um, pseudo separate file system within the global Ceph file system is all wrapped up um, in a new class which is part of the dual release of Ceph called uh, CephFS volume client. So the, the motivation here um, is to allow us to iterate on this and test and release this independently of Manila and hide the Ceph implementation details from Manila. Um, this is very lightweight at the moment. It's really, I think it's less than a thousand lines of code, um, but it will grow a little bit in the future as we need to support um, more Manila features beyond just um, creating and removing shares and um, authorizing them and, and denying them. And that's a diagram of where the separation is between CephFS volume client and Manila. Um, it's worth being aware of this because the top half of that is in one Git repository and one project's release cycle, and the bottom half is in a different Git repository and a different project's release cycle. So I'm going to continue talking about some of the practical aspects of writing the driver. Um, you, you might imagine that this interface um, for writing these modules for Manila would be something quite sort of stable and well-defined. Um, it's not really as stable as we would have liked. Um, throughout the Metaka cycle, there were a series of changes to the interface which we had to kind of um, roll with. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I shouldn't throw stones because I don't document all my own code perfectly, um, but the documentation for the driver interface is such that it's necessary to get quite involved in the Manila project, quite involved in the code base um, to work out exactly what you should be doing um, and how you should be handling things. Um, Aside from those sort of hygiene issues with the protocol, um, there's a more fundamental issue, which is that uh, Manila drivers are not able to define their own network protocols. So historically, drivers were things that let you talk to um, an NFS filer um, or a storage appliance. And they typically implement um, NFS or possibly SIFs if you're lucky. So Manila has hard-coded the list of network protocols. Um, with open source file systems, it's not the case. CephFS has its own protocol. So does ClusterFS. So does Luster. So does GFS2. Um, so at the moment, when you want to add one of these protocols, you have to um, actually edit a series of places um, in the Manila code base. You have to edit the, the Python client, 
the, um, the UI, the API server, along with writing all the corresponding unit tests for all of these different places um, for something that ideally you would really be able to declare from inside your driver. Now that I'm done complaining, I'll move on to the tutorial of how you actually use this. So caveats up front. You need a Manila version equal to a greater than attacker. You need Ceph Dual or higher. Um, and with both of these things, we're, we're still in the process of like smoothing off rough edges so there will be point releases and you will want to make, make sure you've got the most recent ones. Uh, the guests that want to access a Ceph file system using the native protocol need access directly to the Ceph cluster. And that's really the biggest caveat right now. And that's what makes me say that, that this driver is the first step in a series. Um, most public clouds would not want to do this. Well, actually, I would say all public clouds would not want to do this. You do not want to give untrusted third-party code access to your Ceph network, to your storage network. Um, however, if you have certain use cases, you might find this useful. For example, if your virtual machines are somewhat trusted and they're being used as container hosts for untrusted applications within it, and you want something that will give you a file system for your volumes for your containers, so you've got another level on top of it that's going to isolate your applications, you might consider deploying this. So again, because we're using the native protocol, the guests need to have the CephFS client software installed. Um, that's you know, not a fundamental issue, but it's kind of annoying if you've got you know, pre-built images. Um, you need to update them to make sure they've got the uh, client software in. Um, and at the moment, the quota limitations on the size of shares are enforced client side, which means you need to somewhat trust your client. Um, that's really less of an issue than the fact that you need access to the cluster network. So the general sense is whatever's mounting these file systems needs to be something somewhat trusted um, and not uh, random third-party code. So firstly, you need a CephFS file system. Um, setting up CephFS is very straightforward. You would use Ceph Deploy or Ceph Ansible or whatever the tool of your choice is to create an MDS daemon. And then you need a pool for your uh, data and a pool for your metadata. And finally, register those pools with Ceph for use as a file system with the Ceph FS new command. Once you've done that, you can start setting up Manila. So the Ceph uh, driver is part of part of Manila itself, as are all the other drivers. So there's no separate package to install. You'd install your Manila package built from Metaqua or more recent. You also need libradoS and libcephfs. Those are the libraries um, that are going to be used for the driver to talk to the Ceph cluster. And make sure that your Manila server actually has a um, connection to your Ceph network. Um, that's obviously less of an issue than connecting your guests to it, but it still needs to be the case. The Manila server will also use a Ceph identity of its own. Um, there is a great big command line in the docs for creating that. Um, it's, uh, it's huge because it has a white list of which administrative operations Manila is allowed to do. So we've put that in there uh, so that if there are any sort of unexpected bugs or glitches with Manila, um, it's not at risk of wiping out um, other stuff that's going on on your Ceph cluster. And once you're happy that you've gone through this process, run Ceph status with your client.manila key to check that everything's OK. Once that's happened, you can actually load your config into Manila itself. So make sure that key ring that you created is visible somewhere that uh, the Manila service will be able to access it. Um, the default location is best so that you don't have to explicitly configure that. And then you need to add a stanza like this to your Manila config file. So we're telling it, the share backend name is CephFS1. Here's the path to the Python module that we want to use. That's the path to the CephFS driver. Uh, and there's the config file that belongs to Ceph. And that's going to tell the libradoS and libcephFS instances that we have everything they need to know about how to connect to Ceph. You also need to create a share type um, for CephFS. Share types are a Manila concept. Once you've got Manila up and running, you can go ahead and create a share. Um, there's probably some restarting of services that needed to happen in between here, but that's going to depend on you know, what packages you're using and how you're doing all of that. So when we create a share, we refer to the share type that we uh, created earlier. We give the share a name. Um, and the, the CephFS before the one is where we're telling it to actually use um, the, the, uh, the CephFS backend. Actually, that should be. 
I think that should be the name of the back end from the previous slide, but uh, no one picked me up on that when I presented this at Vault last week, so I got away with it. Um, I'm creating a one gigabyte share here, which isn't terribly useful, but yeah. Um, and then, as I said, you can't do anything with the share until you've authorized someone to access it. So here we're going to call Manila Access Allow um, for a user called Alice. What the driver is going to do on our behalf here is go and talk to Ceph, create an ID and a key for a user called Alice, and give Alice the auth caps that she needs to access the share that we just created, or specifically to access the directory that we created to embody the share that was requested by the user. And then finally, all of that stuff gets passed through into a CephFuse command that picks up that user, picks up the um, auth caps that we created for it, and creates a mount point that will treat the directory that we created as its root. If you want to go a little bit um, further, one of the interesting things you can do at the moment with Manila is have multiple backends on one server, and that includes having multiple CephFS backends. Uh, so, for example, you might choose to have um, two different backends that were using a different uh, root directory for creating their volumes in. Um, so, if you do that, then you could have a different um, root directory that had a different layout that pointed to a different OSD pool. Um, and that way you'd have um, a backend that went to one OSD pool and a backend that went to another OSD pool. Um, in Joule, we also added experimental, um, the experimental ability to create more than one uh, file system within a Ceph cluster. Um, and these separate file systems would use separate MDS instances. So if you wanted to, say, um, put some more sensitive workload, latency sensitive workloads on a less loaded MDS and some more, sensitive, uh, some more bulk workloads on some other MDS, you could achieve that today um, by creating multiple backends and giving each backend a different ceph.conf that had a different set of settings for which file system to use on the backend. Now I'm going to move on to what for some people is the interesting part, which is how do we go from this initial CephFS native driver, which comes with a long list of caveats, to something that is suitable for deploying clouds um, with a shared file system service that can be used by your third-party guests, your third-party tenants. So the obvious thing to do is to put some NFS between Ceph and the guests. And the NFS um, servers would create a bridge between your storage network, where your Ceph cluster lives, and whatever network it is you want to use. Um, for the guests to access this. So you would have some other network that you've created using your, your virtualized networking, create a new virtual machine which will act as an NFS server, connect it to the network you just created, create your guest to the network you just created, um, and then you would have guests that could access a CephFS file system without needing access to the um, storage network. So this isn't necessarily a bad idea. It's not as simple as it first sounds. So if you want the level of high availability or the level of performance that you've come to expect from a Ceph cluster, you can't just spin up one virtual machine. You need to spin up multiple virtual machines. You need to handle a case where one of them goes down and you need to create a new one. Um, and this is tractable, um, but somebody needs to come along and actually do the work to make it happen. And it's even if you go to the trouble of doing all that work, as you can see, you still have this extra hop. Um, it's an extra failure domain. It's an extra piece of latency. It's just all around uh, kind of suboptimal. The perhaps um, slightly farther out um, but ultimately preferable way of doing this is what um, some people call hypervisor-mediated access to shares. So this is a little bit like what we currently do for RBD and Cinder where the hypervisor machines have access to the storage network, and they handle the challenge of um, controlling what the guests, guests can see and exposing it up into the guest. Uh, so the guests no longer need to connect over an IP network to anything. They no longer need to know about a remote network or a remote address they need to talk to. They just communicate somehow with their hypervisor to say, I would like my file system, whatever that may be. And all of that potentially security sensitive work of, um, of working out which file system that is and exposing it happens on the hypervisor. So it's very good for security. And it's also great for simplicity, because you don't need a cluster of anything between you 
and your uh, guests, and you don't need um, any vir extra virtualized networking configuration between your storage and your guests. So the question at the moment is what, uh, what should coordinate all of this and what should that last link between the guest and the hypervisor be? So in this diagram, it says NFS over VSOC, and that's our preferred approach. So in Tokyo, um, Sage went through um, in his presentation, a number of different options for this. And at the moment, this is what we're favoring. So the idea is to take the existing NFS client, which exists in the Linux kernel, um, existing CephFS NFS server implementation that we have in the form of, of NFS Ganesha, or indeed the kernel NFS daemon, and expose it to guests using uh, this new piece of functionality, which um, we're hoping to see land in the upstream Linux kernel soon, called VSOC, which gives us a... Um, guest to host network socket with no IP networking involved. If we can adopt VSOC, then it saves us the effort of maintaining any special code inside the guest for dealing with file systems. You have this little special piece of code for dealing with VSOC, um, but just the networking part, no extra file system. So we avoid the need to, for example, maintain um, that 9P protocol and NFS at the same time. We avoid the need to maintain something for uh, something special for exposing the file system into the guests because we can just use NFS Ganesha, which would be the same piece of software that we would use um, if we were running a remote NFS daemon. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, there are some uh, prior presentations that are online at the moment, both Sage's and um, also Stefan's, who is the engineer working on getting this upstream into the Linux kernel. Once you have this um, path between your hypervisor and your guest, uh, you, you need something to coordinate it. Um, so initially, you might wonder, well, should that be Manila, or should that be Nova, or should it be something else? And after, after some sort of discussion, we're very much of the opinion that it should be Nova because Nova is the component that knows about the hypervisors. It knows where guests are running. It knows when they're getting migrated. Um, and of course, there is um, prior art for this in the form of what's currently done for Cinder with the Nova integration and the concept of a, um, an attachment of a volume to a virtual machine. So there's this new, um, new concept needed in Nova called a share attachment. Um, and attachments need to know how should they expose the file system into a guest? Because NFS VSOC is only one option. You, know, you do also have libvirt 9p and potentially um, other protocols and options in future. You could, for example, you could do lots of things. You could, if you're feeling crazy, you could create an IP network between the host and the guests and run SIFs over it if you wanted to. I mean, that might not be crazy if you had Windows guests. So it's important that this is um, flexible enough to do that. And then also, how does the storage get from the storage cluster to the hypervisor to begin with? So we're talking about having um, an NFS daemon that consumes CephFS um, on the hyper hypervisor, but you might equally want to use the same mechanism for doing hypervisor-mediated access to some other storage backend. Um, if you are still using um, a device that just supports NFS and you're happy with that and you want to run NFS to your hypervisor and then some other protocol from the hypervisor into the guest, um, this mechanism should be um, flexible enough to deal with that. And there's a spec online that the um, engineers f from um, eBay are working on at the moment right now. Finally, once you've uh, got your sort of high level ideas and concepts in Nova of how to make this link and expose things into the guest, there is some plumbing that needs to be done specifically for the VSOC case. So VSOC has um, host local addresses. Each guest gets an address called a, a CID. Um, those get assigned at instant startup. So something needs to assign the addresses and write them into the domain XML if you're using um, queuing UKVM. Uh, Ganesha needs to know how to authenticate based on those things. Um, and libvirt needs to know how to map those things from the XML into the command line for QEMU. Neither of those things, none of those things is independently particularly complicated, um, but it's to give you an idea of the amount of little pieces of plumbing that are gonna be involved in making this a reality. Um, that's my preemptive excuse for it taking a long time. Um, there are some more short-term actions um, that we need to take with Ceph and Manila. So some of the stuff I've talked about today um, 
didn't quite make the cut for Jewel, and so there's stuff that's landing at the moment that's going to get backported. Um, the driver does work today, but um, things like the uh, DF basing its output on quotas, um, we need to make, make sure we backport all the right stuff. Um, I want to make sure I have time for questions, so I'm going to skip past that. Currently, the driver has a concept of data isolation, where you can pass an option um, into share creation, and it'll create you a separate CephFS pool for that. Um, it would also be possible to extend that to metadata isolation. Um, so this is similar to what I was talking about earlier with having multiple backends that used a different file system, but we'd be able to do it within a single backend and have it set on a share-by-share -share basis to say um, this share for this tenant should use a different file system uh, without having to have multiple um, backends. Um, it would also be possible to orchestrate the creation of virtual machines that would act as MDSs. So once, if you got to the position where you had lots of shares that all wanted independent MDSs, obviously you wouldn't want to do that on your general hardware storage backend because you wouldn't know in advance how many MDSs you'd need. So you could. It would be interesting to try virtualizing this. Finally, this is the beginning of um, a series of stages that are, that are possible with CephFS and Manila. So the native driver, not suitable for most public cloud use cases today, but the code that we've written for it would be the basis for any of these subsequent pieces of work, whether it's NFS in virtual machines or hypervisor-mediated access um, or whatever the community um, is, is ready and um, enthusiastic about working on. Uh, and I like, to, I like to end with the links to the mailing list and the bug tracker and that kind of thing. So if you do try out any of this, please come back to us and um, talk to us and submit bugs especially. Thanks very much. Okay, question? Yeah. How are you going to handle NFS logs in this configuration with NFS per virtual machine? If two virtual machines on different hypervisors success, same file, and using logs, especially in case of CEFs for Windows or anything else, mm -hmm. how are you going to handle logs? Thank you. Um, the same way that we do in any other clustered NFS environment. So the, um, the NFS demons running on the hypervisors become a sort of implicit cluster. Um, in the way that NFS Ganesha works on top of CephFS, um, they can store enough of what they need to do to do the NFS layer coordination inside CephFS. So each one individually is talking down into CephFS to store whatever it needs to store, um, and then the demons running on different hypervisors will be able to see each other's state. And that's exactly the same way it would work if you were deploying a cluster of virtual machines running NFS demons. Uh, yes. Oh, um, you mentioned that the, the guests need to respect the quota. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. But you mean that when you create a share uh, on CephFX that uh, it's like five gigabytes, the user may be able to write more than that? Yeah. So because in the native protocol, clients are somewhat trusted. Um, this is one of the, you know, the big motivations for later having NFS on top of it. Um, if you... Today, if you recompiled your um, CephFS client to ignore the quota, um, then you could do so. Similarly, today, if you recompiled your CephFS client to take a lock and never give it up and bring the rest of the system to a halt, you could also do that because the nature of the native Ceph protocol is that clients are somewhat trusted. I see. That you, then you cannot implement like uh, prevent uh, the user from writing any other thing like surpassing the quota. Um, it, it would be possible to um, enhance Ceph to enforce quotas on the server side, um, but that's not in progress at the moment. Okay. And uh, I think I saw written uh, create from snapshot read only. Mm -hmm. Is that like intended or you cannot do writable? So snapshots in CephFS are read only. Um, the issue that comes up with Manila is that the way that Manila wants to provide users with access to a snapshot is to allow them to clone from it. Whereas in Ceph, we expect that someone creates a snapshot and then we expose it in a directory called .snap um, and they can just go look at it. There's no need to clone something else to go and look at it. Um, but Manila doesn't currently have the concept of a read-only share. So when they do clone from sna snapshot, if we wanted to implement that so that it just pointed to one of our snapshots, we would be giving them a share that looked like it should be writable but really wouldn't be. Um, so the, the solution to that is to um, 
give Manila the ability to have read-only shares so that we can do a nice efficient implementation of clone from snapshot with the caveat that it's read-only. And I think for, for many um, users that's, that's acceptable because snapshots in a file system context are usually used for backup rather yeah. than snapshots in a block device context where they're used for creating guests. There are ongoing discussions of alternate uh, snapshot semantics. Would, be, would you be more interested in all other approaches instead of that one if there is, in fact, a semantic for yeah. exportable snapshots? Yeah, so there were discussions in Tokyo about the snapshot semantics, and um, there, it could be that that will um, supersede the need for a read-only share concept. If, if the snapshot semantics can express what we want to do, then that could also work, yeah. Okay, thank you. As far as I've counted, you've mentioned three things that typically take a relatively long time to trickle into a distro that no s very few Ceph developers and very few OpenStack developers actually have any control over. That's VSOC in the kernel. Um, that is um, the whatever you need in Libvirt. And that is uh, NFS Ganesha packaging. So the Neither Ganesha of which currently exists in, in, in many right. distros. Do yeah, you have even an educated guess for an, e for an ETA? Um. No. Okay. Uh, at least Thank you. Not, 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 in, not in this forum. Um, but um, the Ganesha changes have already landed in Ganesha. Um, it's, so there is at least one of those, one of that list that is, is already somewhat further along. on the list, but never mind. Um, well, the, um, the, kernel, the kernel part is the, the biggest one, mm -hmm. and it's, but it's also the part that it's most info important to get right before landing it, because once it's in there, it's going to be in there you know, forever. Um, so um, we'll we'll have to wait and see, but hopefully soon. Okay, yes. Um, in your example on how to set this up using the existing driver, you demonstrate that you need to create an access key for the client VM to access the CFFS share quote quote share. Mm -hmm. How do we get the key into the VM? Is there an automatic way of doing that? Right. I sh that's a caveat that I should have covered. Um, so one of the things that we want to um, add in Newton to Manila is the ability to have it return the keys um, from a share. Currently, um, if, you're, if you create a new identity in the process of authorizing someone, so if the thing you authorize is a user that didn't already exist, you would also have to ask your friendly local Ceph admin to go and use his command line tool to get the key for you. Um, so that's one workaround. The other workaround for that issue is um, at installation time, you can pre-create identities um, as, as a Ceph admin, you can pre-create identities for your tenants and then instruct your tenants um, to authorize their shares for those identities that they would already have the keys to. Um, but historically, uh, Manila was based on the idea that the things we were authorizing, things like IP addresses, were external entities that already existed. Um, so Ceph is new and different in that the things that we're authorizing are getting created on demand and so we need Manila to be able to pass back the keys for us. Okay, thank you very much.